I, um, the cause of your scientific enjoyment will be maybe a little bit the talk I'll give, but more important, if you come to the conference that I run every summer, the ASIC Interdisciplinary Conference, the days are free until four every day, and then there's talks uh, from four day to that dinner. And uh, this summer, on June 24 to 29, it'll be in the Italian Dolomites on Lake Malvino. And uh, several of you who have been there once or more times can justify this is the best conference you have ever attended. <laughs> so if you're interested, email me. But if you're sitting on the bench, maybe you can even change in one or two, that's okay, but that people can, if they want to, for that seat. Thank you. <laughs> the schedule is tight and the room is kind of tight. <laughs> Thank you. Get back to the beginning. Okay. Why do people and scientists uh, confuse correlation and causation? <laughs> I, I emphasize uh, science because you and all scientists tend to make this confusion, not just lay people. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> well, what am I doing? Yeah, no, I want a uh, water. <laughs> I'm giving you all you know how the water tastes like. Yeah, <laughs> just lost my voice. <clears throat> I'll see if I can uh, manage to get back. Um, the reason that we do it is it's hard. Uh, drawing, drawing causal inference requires induction and abduction. Um, uh, consideration of uh, what could be, thank you, of what could be an infinite uh, number of models and selection of one or more, and then correctly deducing the predictions of each one. So this is uh, difficult for scientists, so it's not surprising that it's uh, difficult for lay persons. You um, might think a scientist can ease the task of deducing the predictions of a candidate causal model using mathematical and computational modeling, which is what we do most of the time when we're trying to assess the models we have in mind. But when faced with new and puzzling data, how do we begin? Well, um, modeling uh, computationally and the like is the last step. First, we have to imagine what models to, come to put in our computational model and so on. And how do we do that? We have to generate a plausible candidate model. So in route to the uh, the induction and abduction, the scientists typically use mental models, each selected from a large sea of possibilities. An evaluation of these mental models, because we want to pick a model that might predict the data, that requires mentally deducing what their implications of that model are. But uh, intuitive uh, predictions or intuitive uh, deduction is usually beyond human capability, except for extremely simple models, or occasionally for models we already know well. Um, and we know that uh, scientists fail, and all of us fail at doing this, because we've got lots of experimental tests, things like Wason's card problem, card selection tests, showing how bad we are logical deduction, or probabilistic inference, uh, witness the window problem of Kahneman, Tversky, and numerous other demonstrations of this sort are all terrible at uh, intuitive uh, deductions. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, coming up with a good causal model is uh, so hard, scientists are usually use existing models when they are trying to uh, decide what might uh, be useful. And uh, of course, that produces a large bias against finding a new cause or a new model if we keep uh, focusing on what we already know. Uh, and when a scientist publishes a new causal model without careful modeling, it's unsurprising that such models are often ambiguous, especially if they're stated verbally, or wrong, or both. <laughs> Of course, we've heard about the fuzziness of the concept of causality. I'll call it fuzziness. Uh, um, we heard in our first talk by Lauren the multiple different aspects of causality that we should be taking into account. Um, and uh, it's a cognitive construct, not a normative one. It's, a, it's something we all as humans think we understand to some degree or other, usually with different ideas of what, the, what it means. Um, 
it's easy to think sometimes if we hear that A and B are correlated, it's easy to think of reasons why A might cause, well, I should say it's easy. Sometimes it's easy to think of reasons why A might cause B or B might cause A. Sometimes it's very hard to think of reasons. But it's easier to think of that than to invent the third cause, C, which might cause both. So one of the real issues we face as scientists when we're reviewing papers is we often hear claims of causality. And we, as reviewers, we're responsible for trying to think of new causes that the authors didn't think of that could be causing the uh, uh, correlations that they're trying to explain. Um, sometimes these uh, uh, causes are easy to imagine when we hear and they are correlated. Smoking cigarettes is correlated with dying of lung cancer. And based on our general knowledge of what we've heard about science, we can imagine causes. Um, other times, uh, a plausible mental model could be wrong. And one example we have heard many times, hormone replacement therapy is correlated with reduction in heart disease. That was claimed at one time, but it was later found not to be plausible. Other things were responsible for both. Um, or it just wasn't uh, very good data. Um, sometimes uh, very strong correlations can be due to chance or to unknown causes. And uh, often in these cases, the two things being correlated seem unconnected. <laughs> so it seems obvious there's unlikely to be a causal connection. This is one example you have sometimes pointed out. What is this? This is something about films Nicolas Cage appeared in over the years, and a number of people who drowned by falling into a pool. You can perhaps think of a causal connection between those two, but <laughs> it seems unlikely. <laughs> Um, implausible correlations, but that they are deep causal, is an acute problem for scientists because these occur rarely, but they're often critically important. Generating uh, new causes uh, from an effectively infinite sea of possibilities is difficult for the very best of us, and it's often slow and painful. Uh, witness the development of something like quantum field theory, which has taken place over the last hundred years or whatever. Um, but uh, it is the case that the science advances. When unusual things that we don't expect and unusual data comes along, that we can't use a different theory to expect. And then we have to get new cells. Um, okay, it's, uh, most, it's much more common to encounter correlations that are plausibly causal. We see this all the time, but are not. And this occurs for lay people and scientists alike. So in my own research, I won't have time to go into them. I've had several examples where I was uh, pulled for a while in thinking that uh, there was a plausible moral connection when it wasn't. Examples were heartless queuing and short-term priming and there are others. Um, and uh, it took a lot of time and effort and computational modeling to discover better causes, let's say, than the ones that seem plausible at first. Uh, a, a real world example of this sort of thing is uh, a plausible case that an airplane flies. We've heard this many times because the wing shape causes less pressure on top. A Bernoulli explanation for why planes go up and stay in the air. And that seems good. We uh, think to understand that, except that planes fly okay upside down. <laughs> and then you realize, wait a minute, it's got to be something more to the story than that. <laughs> The, if you're puzzled, there are plenty of places you can read about this. Yes. <laughs> it's not easy to explain why flame, flames fly. Um, okay. <laughs> Other problems causing difficulty are mistaken assumptions about the way that causality must work. And this can lead everyone astray, magicians and scientists and theorists. Newcomb's paradox is an example I often use. So uh, choose one or two envelopes. Um, the two envelopes, you don't know the content, you see them in front of you, but they contain either a dollar each or a thousand dollars each. And you're supposed to take one or take two, trying to maximize your gain. That seems pretty simple. But you make this choice twice under the drug Medazla. That means that your reasoning is fine while you're making the choice, but you don't remember what you did. Okay. Now, the, uh, it turns out that the envelopes this time are filled with $1,000 each if you chose one the other time, but are filled with a dollar each if you chose two the other time, but you don't remember. All you do, all you know is you made this choice previously or another time. 
Okay. So now the question is, what do you do? Well, one answer is whatever's in the envelopes in front of you is there. They're fixed. You cannot change with the envelopes by any decision you make. That means backwards causality. So therefore, you're violating the rules of causality, and therefore, you should take two. Doesn't matter. Argument two. If you take one, you would have taken one on the other occasion, because you're you, reasoning the same way. Therefore, you should uh, take one and get a thousand dollars. It's better than taking two and getting two dollars. Okay, which is the right reason. Okay. Well, people disagree about this. It's, this is usually phrased in terms of uh, of God making the decision rather than you. But this is a better way to make it plausible for those of you who don't want to have metaphysical religious arguments. Um, so I argue you should take one. But many of the best human uh, thinkers disagree, probably for reasons of this uh, thinking about causal uh, back to causality. Um, I think the cause of the contents of the envelopes, both now and on the other occasion, is not your choice now. You're not changing what's in the envelope. The cause of the contents on both occasions is your own reasoning. It's correlated. Whatever you reason now, you reason last time. And that's the cause. It's the third cause that's causing both the occasions. Okay? This example of uh, A and B being correlated, are both caused by a different cause C. That's my argument. But you know, as I say, the best people in the world still disagree about this. You can find arguments for everyone. Uh, I've given talk recently about the difficulty of drawing, of drawing causal inference, illustrated by the simplest form of correlation, one that you and most people, even laypersons, think they understand, linear regression. Now you all obviously understand linear regression. You draw a straight line through the data, representing a correlation between A and B. Uh, what could be simpler? Usually we think of this as uh, maybe with a Gaussian error or something. Well, that seems pretty simple. But uh, first popular example I'll mention is uh, Simpson's paradox. Every department at Berkeley uh, admits more women than men. But then when you look at Berkeley, they admit more men than women. That doesn't seem right. You say, wait a minute, if every department is admitting more women than men, then surely Berkeley is doing so. But no, Berkeley isn't doing so. There are many more men than women. What's going on? Okay, this is a different version of the Simpsons that illustrates sort of one of the aspects of what's going on. We have a regression going this way for this group. We have a regression going this way for this group, but the regression of the whole thing is going the other direction. Now, that seems simple looking at it graphically, but in practice, Simpsons paradox occurs all the time in cases that fool everybody into it. We all get it wrong. In numerous situations, it's so difficult, very difficult. And it, this can get much more complicated than this simple uh, uh, diagram. Uh, second example I want to talk to is regression to the mean. That was explained first by Galton in the 1800s, uh, but it's been misleading scientists ever since. He found that children's heights were less extreme than their parents compared to the population as a whole. We can think of various causal models to explain that, but you know, Galton found that the parent sites were also less extreme than their children, and that uh, seemed to rule out various of the explanations that people were fond of at the time. And uh, he came to a statistical explanation known as regression to the mean. And there's various ways to think about it, but this is the simplest possible example. We take one sample from a Gaussian distribution at the blue bar. That's uh, the sample we take. On average, where is the next sample? On average, it's at the mean. So we're regressing to the mean. On average, we get closer to the mean than the first observation. We take two observations. Each of them is going to be, on average, closer to the mean. So this is the regression of the mean. Simplest example. OK, you might think of this matter of regression of the mean as uh, we fail to understand it because uh, so once you realize that could be going on, surely it's easy to understand it. And so, well, then we come to Lord's paradox, which I like to use as an example. Here's Lord's picture. He published this in 1967 in a two page article of Psychology. He was trying to show that there's something wrong with using a statistical argument, uh, equation, a method, without thought. So he gave an example where use of a statistical method would lead you to an absurd conclusion. And if one was, here's the example. Uh, the girls and boys are weighed when they arrived at school, and then they're that's along this axis, and then they're weighed again 
at the end of the semester. You want to know about the gaining weight or not. And the distribution at the beginning for girls and boys are Gaussian with particular means, and the distributions at the end of the semester are Gaussian with the same means and same variances, same distribution. And in fact, the joint distribution of how much each person gains and loses is symmetrical around the main diagonal. So statistician one says nothing's happening. People are fluctuating in weight, but obviously nothing's going on. You end up with the same weight on average you began with, and someone's like, let's see, well, statistician two, let's see if I have a picture. Statistician two argues that boys and girls are both getting weight, but the boys are getting more. But why? You carry out an analysis of covariance, you get these regression lines, now we're back to linear regression, you get these regression lines, they're intercepting zero above zero. So the boys are getting more than the girls. They're both getting weight. What? I mean, okay. Does this make any sense? Well, one argument that's been used by various people over the years, you take a girl and a boy of equal weight, then you can look at uh, how much of the, uh, the distribution for each uh, population is above the diagonal, below the diagonal. And you see that um, on average, the boys tend to gain more. Well, you're comparing a light boy to a heavy girl. So wait a minute, we would never want to do that. That's ridiculous, right? We don't, that doesn't make any sense. This is a regression to the mean. The boy, heavy boy, uh, light boy tends to gain weight and a heavy girl tends to lose weight. Just regression to the mean. We we're back to that again. Well, this seems, you know, how could anybody confuse this? Well, um, we're entitled this a, a paradox, if he was being funny. People got confused. So in 1969, he published another two-page article to explain to people that it wasn't a paradox, that it's the second statistician was absurd. This is the wrong use of the analysis of covariance. That, well, you think that would end it now. Now everybody would understand. Well, <laughs> since 1969, there's been a series of very long technical publications by famous statisticians and causal theorists arguing that both statisticians are correct, or might be, depending on what was assumed and what questions being asked, and I could list a whole bunch of these, there's many more. These are many public, long technical publications claiming that statistician too could have been right. Today, Pearl, who was otherwise a pretty bright guy about clause of fears, he argued that only statistician too could be correct, which seems crazy to me. Um, well, um, not one person, in all these publications over the years, has ever given an actual generated model which could generate the large data. They just given they just given theoretical arguments about how it's possible, and I don't think it's possible. Not one of them has ever actually given a model which could generate the data of the menu. Boys getting more than the girls. Um, so I think at least one lesson should be clear: if the world's best scientists, statisticians, and causal theorists. Can reach what other experts think is an absurd inference, which is a lot of more time. Then I think we can include that causal inference and correlation is extremely hard, even in the simplest cases like linear regression. And confusing the two should not be surprising. Now, there's more I could talk about. Um, I will. Do you have any time left? Okay. Then I should say that there's an even uh, more. Um, implausible case of uh, drawing uh, causal inference from linear regression, known as Stein's paradox. And um, for those of you who don't know, if you uh, are measuring a quantity like number of apples produced in a farm in Oregon over 10 years, your best prediction, least squared prediction for the number next year will be the mean. We all know that. And then if you're, uh, let's say, um, measuring the batting average of New York Yankees uh, for 10 years or whatever, then the best prediction for the next batting average will be the mean. And if you're measuring the number of uh, on-time arrivals at the Atlanta airport in some year, the best prediction will be the mean of the Earth observations. And if you were you know, trying to predict those three things, you'd think you'd predict the mean of each. No. It turns out that if you're trying to predict the mean of all three rather than just one, the best predictor by a least squares criteria would be to shrink the estimates 
and not only shrink, and you can shrink them either to zero, let them all get lower, or shrink them to the common mean of all three. Hopefully this seems to you to be bizarre because these are unrelated. There's no causal connection between the three things I just gave you, and it doesn't matter. It turns out that your best predictor by at least your criteria, which is what we usually use, is uh, one of two, what seem to be quite different shrinkage methods. And uh, I haven't ever found anybody who gives a good intuitive explanation of why this is the case. Although Stein's math is pretty simple and straightforward, it's e relatively easy to follow mathematically. It's just not easy to understand intuitively. I'll just give that as another example since it was time. Okay, so anyways, doing this, drawing causal inference, even in the simplest cases, is hard. And that's why people confuse it. That's why we as scientists confuse it as to why lay people uh, confuse the two. And that's the story. <laughs> Great. Uh, I guess uh, that's Greg Cox. <laughs> oh, right. Um, I guess to, to relate the theme of your talk to the theme of the talk we just heard from Danks, uh, where so my, my question is, I guess, um, how important is it that we have a kind of unified plural mathematical account of uh, what ca uh, causation is, given that the plural mathematical accounts fall into all these um, paradoxes? <laughs> Well, let's see. Um, if you have the, the advantage of having a formal mathematical account, even if it only applies in a narrow set of situations, is you at least can work out correctly what are the deductions. We're talking about logic and math. And with time and effort, not intuitively, we can do that. Or we can run, if we manage to get a correct uh, computer simulation and we trust what it does, and we did it right, then we know what the prediction is. So at least deduction is possible with effort and time and, and care and so on. Um, but that doesn't mean that the assumptions are right. That is, deduction, induction and abduction go way beyond deduction. It says, you know, the fact that the model produces a set of predictions doesn't mean that's a good quality model. Now, that, then we're in a completely different sphere. So that, yes, it's possible to uh, carry out deduction correctly with some here and everywhere. But that's a long way from doing uh, uh, causes, do infer causality. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like the simple thing about causation is intervention, right? That's it sort of seems to be a sort of generally accepted view about causation. And all the examples you were giving were ones where either interventions just didn't happen or interventions couldn't happen. And, you know, the, the contradiction to this is that we know that young children are doing very good inference all the time, every day. Why are they doing so well when the, the scientists and statisticians are doing so badly? And, and I think a big reason is that they do experiments. They can actually do interventions. So I'm wondering if how that would figure in this picture that you have. Of the yeah, I mean, you've been doing research on this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you, I assume we'll hear about this. <laughs> all, all I would say is that um, the uh, kinds of things where the children do uh, causal inference reasonably well tend to be much simpler than the kinds of things I'm talking about here where scientists uh, have failed. On the other hand, scientists, intuitively, scientists are bad at forming deductions and, and forming causal inferences. And it's not surprising that they're going to be misled. Why children do better, we'll hear about in a later talk. <laughs> I won't try, I won't try to give an answer. But even scientists do experiments, right? I mean that's that's ultimately the that's ultimately the, the way that you. Well, it's one way. It's not a perfect way. Nothing is perfect, but we do form experiments where we try to control everything. We never can control everything. We do the best we can. There's a million kinds of factors that usually are affecting anything that's happening in a given situation. And we try to control all the factors that are the biggest ones that we imagine are the most important ones. And then we carry out an intervention experiment and so on and so on. It, it works pretty well. Science moves forward. So we know that works reasonably well. Yeah, so um, 
So you gave examples of how we reason poorly causally about you know, instances of correlation, but I'm wondering also about cases like, I think of cases where we just have things like Venice, like for example, legal cases, right, where there, there's no correlations, it's just some evidence, right? And I'm trying to, I mean, there might be correlations like, you know, aggregated over many legal cases, but I'm thinking of an individual case, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And my my you know, PhD advisor, David Vignada, wrote this book about explaining the evidence, right? Where he sort of argues that people are very good at coming up with stories, right? Called stories like maybe some of your examples showed, but we're bad at, and when you say, again, we train a scientist is to come up with alternative stories of how it also could have been. When you come up with something, goes, oh yeah, that, that sounds good, plausible, I go with that. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you see, so is there like a, a more general failure, right? It's just the appreciation of alternative models that can explain the data that applies not just to correlations, but also to single events? Yeah, I would agree with, with Tobias's um, um, summary that um, the same thing does apply for individual cases. <laughs> We're talking about the ease of generating explanations occasionally when they're simple and they seem plausible. Doesn't mean they're right, but you know we, we can come up with some ones. It's harder to come up with uh, more difficult, complex explanations, which might be better. And inventing new ones um, can be very hard. So if we're told that uh, you know in an auto accident that uh, you know person A uh, was drinking and ran over you know person B and killed them or whatever, we can come up with a plausible uh, causal account. And uh, that might be correct, except maybe that wasn't at all. Maybe it was something else that we didn't hear about that could have caused the accident, like a failure of a light signal or something. You know, I mean, so uh, you know, it, these difficulties of uh, forming causal conclusions are universal, and they apply in single cases. I was only talking here about the confusions of correlations and causation, or correlations over multiple cases.